Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Am I on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, welcome to our program. For those of you who were with us last week, you know you're in for a treat. Um, we're so happy to be welcoming Professor Mark Dollinger. But I'm Phyllis Marcus. I'm chair of the Newmark Institute for Human Relations at the Jewish Community Relations Council. The Institute is now celebrating its 10th anniversary working to create a more pluralistic society through our through education, through programming, and through collaborating with our interfaith and intergroup partners. Um, through the Institute, we strive to create civil dialogue, to create better understanding among ourselves and with others, and to reduce prejudice. Today, one of our pro we are so happy to be participating in this program with the Jewish Federation of St. Louis and Shema Listen to bring you this wonderful speaker who, whose book is called Black Power and Jewish Politics. And today, um, Professor Dollinger will be speaking on Jewish and Black Power. To introduce him more formally, I'm going to call on Alyssa Banford, Director of Civil of Civic Engagement at the Jewish Community Relations Council. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I do hope you were able to join us last week for this incredible program on the beginning of the conversation. Um, if you weren't able to, however, uh, we do have a recorded video of um, that session and we will be sending out an email after this session to all those who have registered um, with that link. And uh, you will find in that link um, our racial equity consultant, Tari Nusinov, um, giving the full uh, description of Dr. Dollinger's tremendous accomplishments. Um, but for now, in the interest of time, I am going to turn it over to our wonderful speaker um, to help us learn about the intertwined histories of the Black community in America and the Jewish community in America, and help us learn more about um, how we engaged and grew together or grew separately, um, and how we can potentially grow further together in the future. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Dollinger. Thank you, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and welcome back. It's, uh, it's great to see you again. Well, it was 1972, and this is my favorite Google image from the 1970s. In 1972, I was living here in the almost all white suburbs of Los Angeles called the Palos Verdes Peninsula. If any of you know Southern California, it's about 20 minutes south of LAX right there on the water. Well, if you lived in LA in 1972, it was important because, and this is where I get in trouble sometimes when I do this talk here in the San Francisco Bay Area, it was uh, the year that the Lakers won their first national championship. And, uh, to date myself further, this was the era of uh, Wilt Chamberlain playing for the Lakers, um, most famous for having scored 100 points in a single game. Uh, they didn't have the three-point shot then, but I'm sure Wilt was probably not taking too many three-pointers. And uh, my Laker, friends, Laker fan friends let me know as well. He was not yet a Laker when he scored 100 points, but we can take credit for him anyway. Back in those days, the Lakers played in Inglewood's fabulous forum. Uh, now, of course, they're playing downtown at Staples Arena, but uh, back in the day when they played at the fabulous forum, it turns out they weren't the only basketball team that was playing there. So when I was in third grade, my mom took my big brother and me to, to go to the, to the forum to this basketball game. And uh, okay, this is not a third grade picture of me. I was looking through the old photos to find one, but I just love this one. It's actually taken when we lived in Manhattan. 
and uh, and and there we are. And I just I'm loving my mom's hair and the glasses the whole bit. Um, she took us to see the Harlem Globetrotters. It was fantastic. Um, I was able to watch the skill and the antics of Meadowlark Lemon, of Fred Curly Neal, and it turns out uh, they offered me a course direction in life. Because when that game ended, and my mom asked, you know, what'd you think, how was it? I told her, when I grow up, mom, I'm gonna be a Harlem Globetrotter. Crushing my spirit, she said, no, you're not. And I said, why not, mom? And she said, because you have to be black to be a Harlem Globetrotter. And at that moment in my white suburban life, I realized that the Harlem Globetrotters were black, that I was white, and that it meant something. Well, apparently I was a slow learner because uh, I went from there to uh, Temple Beth Ellen Center in San Pedro, California, to the synagogue and the religious school and the reform movement. And when I was raised in the reform movement in the 70s, and I went to Sunday school, we of course learned about the holidays, but really there were three topics on the curriculum each and every year. Um, sadly, of course, one was the Holocaust, and we learned about the horrors of World War II. And for all the Jewish educators out there, I would just like to offer some unsolicited educational advice. Please do not show the French Holocaust film Night and Fog to first graders, okay? It's developmentally inappropriate. I'm still working through it, that's all right. Uh, second, we learned about Israel, of course. And um, our favorite, or at least my favorite part of the year was the annual Trees for Israel campaign by the Jewish National Fund. We would get these cardboard uh, cutout cards and it would have 10 slots for quarters. You may remember these. And if you put a quarter in every slot and brought it in, um, you would get a tree in Israel. Um, and uh, of course the rabbi, you know, would give you your certificate and here's a, here's a picture of a certificate. And then would, you know, say someday, may you go to Israel and visit your tree. Okay, a little bad news. Uh, on my first trip to Israel in high school, I went to find my tree. Uh, it turns out when you buy one tree in Israel in the fourth grade, they don't actually put your name on it. I later learned that uh, you need to buy 10,000 trees, a grove, before you get a naming opportunity. Uh, but uh, that notwithstanding, the third point, the third issue that we learned about each and every year was social justice. And of course, this is one of the several uh, well-known images of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, two people to his left is Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And I think it's over to the left, um, you know, even, even more of the national figure. So, um, well, we learned about uh, white Jewish support for the civil rights movement. We learned about the March from Selma, and um, we learned about all of the protests. So with all of this, I landed on the campus of Cal Berkeley to start college in the fall of 19, okay. And uh, in case you don't know Berkeley, this is where Mario Savio changed the world in the free speech movement in the mid 1960s. And um, I gave this talk um, to a consortium of synagogues in San Diego, California last week. And uh, Rabbi Devora Marcus, like, like interrupted right here, turns out her dad took this picture. I had no idea. He was a student photographer in Berkeley in the 60s. Um, they've created what's called the Free Speech Cafe on campus now, when you can go to campus now, and apparently all of her dad's pictures are, are throughout the cafe. So this is Mario Salvio speaking from the steps of Sprawl Plaza, and here is a view from the other side. So now you're, you're looking at Sprawl Plaza with those steps. Because the walkway, uh, in the center of the Berkeley campus is where different student organizations would set up tables. And you'd have a table, you'd put a banner out, you'd have all your flyers, you know, sometimes some free gifts to entice students to come and, and pick up stuff. And you, would, and you would sign up for whatever you like. So of course, you know, I start where I should at, the, at Hillel, we called it the Jewish student board back in the day. And, uh, and just for fun, for the Hebraists who are here listening, um, that is the official Berkeley Hillel t-shirt, and it does say Berkeley. Though it does not have vowels, and thanks to the Hebrew language, that could also say Barak Lee, a storm is upon me. 
Or phonetically, you could just call it broccoli, the vegetable that President George Bush didn't like so much. Um, they put the vowels in a few years later to avoid confusion and we all had a rebellion. We said, keep it without vowels so we can have a little fun with the Hebrew. Well, after gathering all the information on, the Jewish, on Jewish student life at Berkeley, of course, I went to the next table, the Black Student Union. And there at the Black Student Union, I greeted uh, my African-American classmate and uh, introduced myself and said, uh, let's start a Black Jewish dialogue. And he burst out laughing. And he kept laughing. I think, until I have to believe, he saw the shock, the horror, and the embarrassment on my face. I was not expecting to get laughed at with that offer. And with compassion, he did all he could to control himself and to ease a really awkward moment. He offered me four words. He said, hey, I'm from Harlem. And on the surface, I knew what Harlem was. It's an African-American neighborhood in Manhattan. But I understood when he said that, he was trying to communicate something deeper for me to learn and understand. And that is, a young black man in America, raised in Harlem, is gonna have a very different worldview than a young white Jewish man raised in the suburbs of LA. And it's only because we both ended up on the same piece of real estate for our college educations that we ended up having enough proximity with one another that we had that engagement. Well, I certainly didn't know it as an 18 year old arriving to college for the first time. That actually was the first day of this book, Black Power, Jewish Politics, Reinventing the Alliance of the 1960s, our subject for today. Good to see you all. Thank you, Alyssa and Phyllis for the wonderful introduction. And uh, for those who were here last week, um, what I'm gonna, for those who weren't here last week, when I get to parts we already covered, I'm gonna go through it. I'm just gonna go through it really quickly so you'll know what we're talking about. And I'm gonna do it quickly out of respect for those who were here last week so that we can make sure um, we cover the new topic today. So last week, when we talked about um, Jews and civil rights in the 1950s, we talked about the word history. History, the study of the past. And that was really, the easy part. The more challenging part we studied was this word, historiography, the graphing of history, the writing of history, the history of how history is written. And we learned that every generation, every new generation of history professors will look at the same moment of history and rewrite it through their own lens whether that's by age, by religion, by race, by whatever identity category you'd like to apply to it, gets worked into um, the narrative. And, um, and we spoke last week about historical memory. The idea that we remember our personal histories, of course, we remember our family history, we can remember Jewish history. And oftentimes, the history we remember is different than the history that actually happened. We tend to remember some parts, we tend to forget other parts, we tend to analyze things in ways we'd like to analyze them, and it ends up being a great story for the dinner conversation, even though maybe all of it isn't totally exactly true. So, so today we are going to look at historical memory again. And tonight we add one more element to our professor's view of history, and this is the historian's craft. You see, when I was in graduate school uh, with Professor Appleby, whom we mentioned last week, um, I learned that the job of the academic historian is to be a third person, dispassionate, critical, analytic scholar who looks at whatever their subject is through the same unbiased lens, or at least as least biased as can be. Like we understand in historiography, every generation you know, will bring their own, their own angle to it. But we have, um, we have what we, have, you know, we have our friends read our chapters before we send them in. Um, they have anonymous peer review before it gets sent out. And it's all about getting the highest quality academic product before it goes into print. Um, so as my professors taught me in graduate school, I said, you could pick any subject in US history you want. You're gonna get a PhD in US history. And if you do a good job writing of it, you know, they'll reward you. And if you don't, you'll get bad reviews. But 
it doesn't matter who you are as a person. It really matters how well you do the job. And that was sort of a classic idea of learning in the education. Until I was uh, in my classroom at SF State as the book was just in its final stages. And the professor before me in class was an African-American man in the communication studies department. And uh, what that meant was two days a week, we got to have a conversation for five to eight minutes when he was cleaning up the room and I was setting up the room. Uh, and, uh, and we're chatting and at one point in the semester, he says, my students are doing their oral reports next week. We'll probably run late. If you wouldn't mind keeping your students in the hall so I don't have, so we don't interrupt them. I said, of course, no problem. And by the way, what's the oral report gonna be on? And he said, oh, it's on how the student's race or ethnicity informs their communication style, which makes sense because this was a course in communications. I let him know that in the Department of Jewish Studies at San Francisco State, at least in my classes, we never have an oral report like that because I don't permit my students to reveal their Jewish identities if they're Jewish because we have a problem in Jewish studies. We get this cohort of Jewish kids and they're at Hillel together and they go to Jewish summer camp and maybe they went to Jewish day school and they're dating one another and they're breaking up with one another and there's drama and they all show up in a pack and they sit in the middle of the classroom and they're off and running. And my other half of the class who are just regular ordinary undergraduates are like staring and watching the whole scene. And what I find is I get a bifurcated classroom where the Jewish students are sort of in the center and the students who don't identify as Jewish, Jews are on the periphery and the non-Jews tend not to talk as much because you know, this is a Jewish studies, you know, that whole thing. So I let them know the first day, everyone is equal in this class and everyone's gonna participate equally. I kind of thought my colleague in communication studies would appreciate that I'm doing the opposite thing for the same reason. And then he looked at me and he said, he said, Mark, he said, you know what? And he always goes like this. He says, my blackness is on every word I teach and every word I publish. And then he said, your whiteness is on every word you teach and every word you publish, except you don't have to say so. Wow. I spent a lot of time reflecting on that, especially because I was about to publish a book that whose first two words were black power. So I called my editor and I said to my editor, I said, I got to break the most basic rule of academic history. I need to insert myself into my own narrative. I already had an introduction for the book. So I said, let's call this a preface. And I'm going to write a preface about who I am as a white suburban LA Jewish kid growing up, going to the Harlem Globetrotters game, showing up on my first day of college, wanting to do a black Jewish alliance and getting laughed at. So the introduction I just gave you today is actually the preface of the book. And the pedagogical or scholarly reason for this preface and these stories is so that anyone reading my book will know who's writing it as much as I could possibly communicate in the 15 pages I had, so they can assess or judge my conclusions with as much information as knowledge as they have. And that's something that's very different than I learned in graduate school and certainly in our current climate as we have our national reckoning on race and especially in these last uh, few days in Wisconsin. Um, I think that more and more scholars are going to be moving to this direction and I'd be curious to talk to my friends in graduate history departments to see if they're still teaching things the way um, they taught me. So for those of you who were here last week, you will remember this is, yes, dare we say it, the filiopietistic historiographic analysis of the post-war period. And for the rest of you, it's the letter Y, the 25th letter of the English alphabet. And this is a visual description of what the first generation of books were about. African-Americans over here on the top left, white Jews over here on the top right, you see they're apart, they're different from one another in American history, but then look, they come together in the middle of the Y, this is the civil rights movement, and they march together in peace and harmony. This is how all the first books on black Jewish relations describe the relationship. The two were different, then they came together and everything was good. We learned last week, there was a problem with the Y. And that's because in the mid-60s, blacks and white Jews split. 
So we have here blacks and whites, they come together only for about 10 years from the mid 50s to the mid 60s. And now when we go down here to the bottom of today, the two groups are split. And we're hoping now in the last few months, especially we may be in, in a new era in the historiography where the groups are gonna get proximate again um, to one another. So, um, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, today, uh, I'm gonna have a pop quiz for all of you. And uh, Alyssa has agreed to, uh, to be our moderator for this. And, and here's how it's gonna go. I am going to give you an historical text. It's from the book. So by the way, if you've already read the book, thank you. You're not permitted to give the answer, nor share the answer with the person watching with you, nor send a private chat to somebody else to give them the right answer. You have to follow the honor code uh, and just hold off. Um, I've done three things to each of these quotations. First, I've uh, removed the name of the person who said it. Second, I've removed the year it was said. And uh, here's the third thing. I did this at the Hartman Institute in New York back when we could travel. And they're very smart at the Hartman Institute. And they know, they know that African Americans have been described using different words over time. And they could pretty much date the document just by looking at what word was being used to describe African Americans. So, so here's my truth and honesty in being a history professor. I've changed them all. You can have absolutely no confidence that whatever word is being used can date it so that we can do that. Um, and by the way, if you don't know the exact person or the exact year, that's fine. Just what kind of person and about what year would it, it would be. So here's our first quote. Black power stresses black initiative, black self-worth, black identity, black pride. Black power seeks the growth and development of black economic and political power. Black power seeks black leadership development. So the question for you is who said this and when? And, um, and Alyssa, I think um, you're gonna call on people so they can either, if you want, actually Alyssa, if you wanna unmute yourself and give them the instructions, that'd be great. Yeah, if, um, if you think you know the answer, you'd like to make a guess, go ahead and raise your hand and I will, um, unmute you. You can raise your hand digitally or you can physically raise your hand. Not seeing anyone. Black power stresses black initiative, self-worth, identity, and pride. Black mm -hmm. power seeks the growth and development mm -hmm. of black economic and political power. It looks like Kent has an idea. As an idea. Kent. I was going to say somebody like Stokely Carmichael and it might have been in the late 60s. Thank you, Kent. Excellent answer. Okay, let me catch everybody up on that. Um, Stokely Carmichael, the leader of the Black Power Movement. The Black Power Movement rose in the mid-60s, so the late 60s would be an excellent guest. Stokely Carmichael absolutely would stress Black initiative, self-worth, identity, and pride. So let's look at our picture of Stokely. Oh, no. It's the American Jewish Committee from 1969. All right, so first of all, I would like to congratulate Kent for giving the correct, incorrect answer. That's exactly the one I wanted. That one or Malcolm X is also a good one to have. Um, and, uh, and Kent has illustrated the lesson of today, which is, I'll let you know, Kent, when I was in the archives and I saw that quote, it was Stokely. I absolutely thought it was Stokely because this, this is what the leader of the Black Power Movement should say. It's absolutely not what the American Jewish Committee would be saying, I would think. Now, just for those who may not be aware, the AJC is one of the country's largest and most important national Jewish self-defense groups. It is centrist, absolutely, and for times it's even be pushing a little bit to the political right. So our question is, how would a centrist national Jewish organization in 19, what was it, 69, say such positive things about black power. This is an historiographic moment. Because Kent and I both assumed it had to be Stokely, and it turned out not to be Stokely, but turned out to be um, a, a national Jewish organization, something's going on in our historical memory that we've forgotten. And something's gone on in the analysis of earlier generations, which needs revision. Text two, okay, this is not a, this is not a quote, it's just a straight up question. How would the Anti-Defamation League 
respond to the rise of the Nation of Islam. Now, the Nation of Islam is Louis Farrakhan, Malcolm X before that, Elijah Muhammad before that. The ADL, the leading Jewish organization to fight anti-Semitism. So Alyssa, I'll hand off to you if you want to see if anyone wants to tell us how the ADL would respond to the Nation of Islam. Not seeing any digital hands. Does anyone want to uh, unmute themselves and take a stab at this? Yeah, I will. Hi, Guan. Hey, hello. Um, I would assume, and I, I may not be following exactly what uh, is expected here, but I would assume that um, at that time, that relationship would be antagonistic. Thank you. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, um, because historically, any attempts at expression of uh, black strength, um, as, as you know, whether economic or figuratively, um, and like black defense is usually met, has been met with um, fear and aggression. So. Um, and then also be, I, I, I'm assuming maybe because of, uh, more traditional, uh, anti, you know, animosities between Muslims and Jews that, um, yeah, I would, I would expect that relationship to be, um, definitely antagonist. So when I became aware of the nation of Islam, uh, as a young man, I knew at that time that relationship was antagonistic. To, Thank you to, so you know, much. Me. Thank you. Excellent. Looks like Robbie had a hand up too. Uh, yes. Um, I agree antagonistic, but that's because Farrakhan is so anti-Semitic. And based upon the comments made, it's been a long history of animosity between the two organizations. Okay. And absolutely, we would expect the ADL to respond to the anti-Semitism of the Nation of Islam, exactly as Gwen and Robbie were both describing. So here's the story from the archives and the primary source historical documents in 1959, Time Magazine ran a cover story on Elijah Muhammad, who was then the head of the Nation of Islam. He was really the one to, to have it grow most exponentially. And um, it was what journalists call a hit piece, meaning it was terrible. It was just accusing him of being an anti-Semite, a reverse racist, anti-white, you know, and they came up with all this stuff. Um, and uh, and uh, Arnold Forster, uh, who was the head of the anti uh, one of the leaders of the ADL, sent a confidential memo to all of his branch offices, and it said, Time Magazine notwithstanding, we have no documentable evidence of anti-Semitism on the part of the Temple of Islam movement or Elijah Muhammad. Wow. Uh, by the way, this was a confidential memo that said not for publication. So the good news is I checked with my, my, with my advisors. To, I, I'm, al I'm allowed to publish it. Um, why on earth would the ADL be defending um, Elijah Muhammad? And, and he was anti-Semitic. Elijah Muhammad was anti-Semitic, which clearly means there's a relationship between national Jewish leaders and organizations and even the ADL and the Nation of Islam, which I found surprising, because as Robbie is pointing out, you know, Louis Farrakhan, the leader today, is, is not popular amongst American Jews because of, of his anti-Semitism and, and lots of other isms uh, that he says. Um, so uh, how would the American Jewish Committee respond? All right, so right now, let's take a, take a pause, because now we're up to number four in our questions, and you may have already determined a pattern is developing in these. So, um, and you're all giving the correct, incorrect answers, which I appreciate. So back when we can do this in person, I would split everyone into groups and each group would get their own question and they'd have to write down the answer and they couldn't change the answer when they realized they all wrote down the correct, incorrect answer. So now you are obligated not to switch the answer that you would have said, but now you know how it's going um, because of course, how would the American Jewish Committee respond? They're supposed to not like what they're supposed to not like the Nation of Islam, but you can probably tell the, the sources are going to tell a different story. And here, once again, in 1959, same year, Elijah Muhammad is scheduled to give a speech in a place described as a northern New Jersey metropolis. Let's call it Newark, shall we? And uh, 
And the uh, AJC is concerned about his anti-Semitism and the threat he may pose. So they want to go undercover and do some surveillance um, on Elijah Muhammad. There are no black Jews in Newark, New Jersey's AJC at this time. And for a white Jewish person to show up with a clipboard is not a good way to be undercover for Elijah Muhammad. So in a relationship which, um, which should prove a bit troubling, the city of Newark made a deal with the AJC that the public agency was going to uh, engage in surveillance against Elijah Muhammad. And they had an African-American man who was on their human rights commission go in and do it, write up a report, and then share the confidential report with the AJC. So the report said that um, he was he spoken in front of 1,500 or 2,000 attendees, and that he made a cryptic statement that, quote, they killed Jesus and he was preaching good. Well, Jews killing Jesus is like the first anti-Semitic trope ever. And uh, the AJC's public statement was that they were more concerned with the anti-white statements of Elijah Muhammad. They did not consider him to be anti-Semitic. Um, the American Jewish Congress had, 30, uh, had heard a report that 38 black Muslims were jailed in Lorton, Virginia. Here they were forbidden to wear Muslim clothing while they prayed. In this case, it's the American Jewish Congress. What should they do? Well, you know, before you heard this talk, you would imagine that the American Jewish Congress is not interested in intervening in Nation of Islam prisoners and in rights to religious freedom. But uh, sure enough, Shad Polier, here he is um, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr wrote a personal letter to the warden of the prison demanding that black Muslims be guaranteed the same religious freedom as all other prisoners. And while that is certainly consistent with American Jewish life, I think, I don't think today you're gonna to get national Jewish leaders um, sending letters to prison wardens uh, to, to, to support those who are following um, Farrakhan. Text three, the longstanding African-American distrust of white people born of oppression, is manifesting itself in a growing spirit of go it alone. This person said that Blacks were already reevaluating their alliances. They'd come to know their strength in the political and economic arenas. This person predicted a period of mutual irritation and misunderstanding, followed by a spike in new and more active forms of Black anti-Semitism. So the question is, who would have said these things, the parts that are in quotes? Um, and you are obligated to say who you think would have said this before you logged into Zoom this afternoon. So I'll hand it back to Alyssa if you can see, uh, see anyone who wants to try this. Why don't we go ahead and uh, anyone who would like to take a guess, go ahead and unmute yourself. There's a long-standing African-American distrust. It's born of oppression. They're going it alone. They're reevaluating their alliances. They know their strength. And guess what? Anti-Semitism is coming from the African-American community. Not seeing anyone want to step up. That's OK. These are getting more complicated. And I think people know that whatever answer they give, here it is. It's the ADL, Nathan Edelstein from 1960. Now the critical part of this piece of documentation is less that it's the ADL and Nathan Edelstein, it's more the year 1960. Because last week we learned, uh, supposedly the black Jewish relationship was great with King and Heschel when they were marching arm in arm. And at least when I grew up, you know, and I learned about it in religious school, I learned that everything was fine until the rise of black nationalism, the rise of black militancy, the rise of black power, the rise of anti-Semitism in the black community, right? All of those things are what historians call causality. They caused history to go the way history did. Um, and then we find out that four or five years before black power, 1960, this, this is really the, the heart of the best, the best relationships across racial lines in terms of the protests. Now we have a national Jewish leader saying, guess what? There's long-standing African-American distrust of white people. All right, so now we know he's talking to a white Jewish audience, right? So guess what? 
there are long-standing issues in the black community distrusting whites and and it's born of oppression so he's owning it and it's manifesting itself in the spirit of go it alone I never knew that the go it alone separatism was around as early as 1960. But in 1960, blacks were reevaluating their alliances. They were already learning their strength politically and economically. And guess what? <laughs> the ADL leader, Nathan Edelstein, there's going to be mutual irritation, there's going to be misunderstanding, and there's going to be new and more active forms of anti Semitism. So if we read this one document, we have to undermine the X and the Y approach that we learned last week. Because now we see that even national Jewish leaders anticipated the rise of black power. They anticipated that there would be tension between the communities. No one was surprised in Jewish leadership. And I'll just add, these were mostly all white Jewish, old white Jewish men who were understanding the deep systemic racism at play and the way in which it was creating um, just under the surface a lot of tension that maybe, you know, historical memory tends to forget about because it's a lot nicer to remember, um, you know, the picture we see of Heschel and Kay. I'm tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I want to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourself. So we have a few clues here. It says we white men. Okay, it's a white man. And uh, since you're here, you know, at the JCRC Federation event, it's a Jewish white man who said this. Um, so now the question is what white Jewish man would say, I'm tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I'll tell you, he was speaking to a black audience. I want to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. So Alyssa, do you see anybody who wants to uh, venture a guess on this one? Anyone who would like to take a guess, go ahead and unmute yourself. And you can do, you don't have to say the exact person, you can describe the person, the kind of person who would say that. And remember, it's gonna be wrong because I, I set this up so you'll be wrong. So give us, give us the answer you would think it would be so then we can figure out what the historiography needs to be. Everyone has gone quiet. No one brave? All right, so this is predicting, this is predicting the rise of black power, right? That this person's tired of the philanthropy of rich white men. It's time for blacks to take control. It's time for whites to step aside. That's pretty bold. And I'll just share when I read it the first time, I thought it was a white Jewish male leftist, a radical. And it was probably in the late 60s, right? And they're probably going up against a lot of the white liberal Jewish moderates who were upset with black power. And all right, let's see who that Jewish radical was. Joel Springarn, 1914. If you don't know the name, Joel Springarn was the founder of the NAACP with his brother Arthur and W.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to earn the PhD from Harvard. This was not some random Jewish guy. This was probably the most important Jewish social justice activist of his generation because he created the NAACP. And he's speaking in 1914, 50 years before black power. 50 years, 1914, I'm tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I wanna see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourself. Wow. Okay, if it's true that Springhorn said that in 1914, we have to revise our entire understanding of Black Jewish relations and the civil rights movement because we knew the end generations before it even started. And, uh, and, and this actually came, Murray Friedman of Blessed Memory actually found this quote in one of his earlier books um, on Black Jewish relations. So I want, to, I want to say his name out loud and give him credit um, for that because, um, and here's the thing for me as a, as a history professor, you know, 
all of us who are academic historians had access to this quote because Murray Friedman published it. And you can't really write uh, any of the uh, X or Y version if we see this from 1914. Okay, so um, here's your Paul Harvey moment, the rest of the story, if you remember him from radio. Um, all that I just told you was not even the reason I wrote the book or the book I expected to write. I was really interested in the American Jewish turn inward in the 1970s. And the first title of the book was Turning Inward. And as I began to look at the American Jewish turn inward, I started getting drawn back into black power unexpectedly. And then the black power from the mid 60s kept drawing me back to the 50s and then ultimately back to 1914. So here is uh, text five. Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people who are best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. Well, we know it's going to be mid-1960s or later because it's using black power. It's, it's saying that word. The saddest element in this whole frightening picture is that Jews are the people best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. Okay, Alyssa, anyone? Anyone want to guess who said this and, and when? It's not going to be Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, 1966. Oh, wait, it is. Rabbi Hertzberg, Columbia University professor, conservative movement rabbi, author of many books, the most important is probably the Zionist idea, probably the best ideological history of Zionism ever written, at least in English. And, uh, and let's go back and see what he said in 1966. Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture. Okay, guess what? There's a frightening picture in 1966. Black power, black militancy, anti-Semitism is frightening for Jews. So he is announcing to his Jewish brothers and sisters, I get you're scared. But he said, there is something sad going on in your fear. And here's the sadness. Jews are the people best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though Jews are most directly on the firing line of its attack. Hertzberg stood in a place where he understood Jews were being targeted by black power activists who were anti-Israel and anti-Zionist and sometimes anti-Semitic. Yet he said, even though we're most directly on the firing line, we actually, as Jews, should be able to understand what's going on. When I read this quote, it, it actually became the thesis of the whole book. This, was, this is what gave me the thesis for the book. I had to understand how on earth Hertzberg could possibly say this because this is not something I would expect a rabbi to be saying, and certainly not in 1966, and it forced a reevaluation. The positive aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in this respect retracing precisely the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. Well, We'll just get right to the answer here because those of you who were here last week will recognize Rabbi Roland Gittleson, Temple Israel of Boston, Reform Rabbi. He, did, he said this in a sermon in 1969. Actually, he published it in a sermon book from 69. He may have given it a year or two earlier. And here's what we remember about Gittleson from last week. In 1948, Harry S. Truman put him on the White House Council for Civil Rights. He was one of the earliest rabbis ever to engage in social justice work. Then in the 1950s, if you remember, he's the one whose congregants went down the Mississippi to register to vote, and, and they were the ones who got arrested and sent to the prison in Parchment, where the Mississippi rabbis had that. So if I had to think about an historical figure who would be most mad about black power, most upset about the end of the interracial alliance, most connected to the Heschel King version of the history, Rabbi Gittleson would top the list because he literally lived that in his life. Yet, um, to his credit, he's talking about a positive aspect of black power. 
there is a search for ethnic identity. And he said, this we Jews should be able to understand and approve. He said the Negro, the American Negro, today is in this respect retracing precisely the experience of American Jews. Not only does he support black power for, for black power, he believes it has a positive aspect in that it's getting folks to embrace their ethnic identity. And he, he takes Rabbi Hertzberg one step further. Not only can Jews learn from this, but he says, guess what? They're doing what Jews did a generation or two ago. A generation or two ago, Jews had to fight anti-Semitism, in America even, and they had to stand up and be proud of who they were. And now he sees that the African-American community is following the white Jewish community um, a generation or two later. So this, this just stunned me, as you can imagine. Um, what group benefit most from affirmative action in the 1960s? And I, just to let you know, the only groups eligible for affirmative action were historically designated minority groups by the federal government's decision. Jews were not considered um, an historically designated minority group. So Jews were not eligible for affirmative action. So um, which group then would, be, would benefit most? And uh, I'll tell you, when we put this out into the groups, the answer that uh, folks come up with is African-Americans, because that's what affirmative action was designed for. No. And, uh, yeah. Going. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think I know the answer to this. I, I, I've heard that the group that benefited from affirmative action the most were white women. Oh, Gwen, you are excellent. That is correct. Thank you. Uh, well done. And, and, just, and just to let you know, this isn't in the book, but, but it's relative to the theme of the book, so I threw it in. Um, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it one step further from Gwen, okay? As it turns out, um, women were considered a, a designated minority group by the federal government, so women were, were, um, were eligible. Therefore, it turned out white women, as Gwen pointed out, were, received more benefit than, than any other racial minority group did. And among white women, it was Jewish women. Jewish women were disproportionately represented among the white women who were ready for college, ready for graduate school, ready for professional careers, like at every step at which affirmative action would help. So it turns out the ethnic group that was the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action in the 60s were the Jews, even though the Jews as Jews were not eligible, which means the arguments about meritocracy and the arguments against uh, somehow saying that affirmative action is against Jews um, only works if you eliminate half of the American Jewish population. So it turns out to be a gendered question that also has sort of a sexist undertone if we don't consider that. Um, and as it turns out, many programs designed to, to address racial inequality often end up not doing that. Okay, so when I was writing uh, the, the, the book, the last week's book uh, on the 50s uh, and the early 60s, I went into the archives uh, because I wanted to um, look up the Freedom Rides. And um, when I was in the archives, I, I went to something called the Card Catalog. Um, some people don't know what a card catalog is. A lot of you do remember card catalogs. And uh, it said uh, Freedom Ride 1971 which is a typographical error because back in those days we used typewriters. And if you had your finger on the wrong key, you would say 71 instead of 61, right? Because the Freedom Rides were from the earlier decade. Well, I pulled it up anyway. The folder came out. The folder said Freedom Ride 1971, same error. I pulled out the, the, the flyer. It turned out to be a Freedom Ride from 1971. But it wasn't the Freedom Rides for Blacks in the South. It was a freedom ride for Soviet Jews. A freedom ride from Washington DC to Seattle, stopping in cities across the country, having rallies, raising education and consciousness and money for the Soviet Jewry movement. I thought, this is fantastic academically. The Soviet Jewry movement is literally borrowing the name of a civil rights movement action, but now they're turning it towards Jewish identity rather than helping across racial lines. It turns out a third of the Soviet Jewry activists earned their training in the civil rights movement. Uh, Jacob Birnbaum, the head of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry said, many young Jews today forget that if injustice cannot be condoned in Selma, USA, neither must it be overlooked in Kiev, USSR. 
And the way the Soviet Jewry movement got its strength is by appealing to anti-communism. Because let's be honest, if the US Senate and the US Congress, um, well, they're not so interested in helping Jews in the Soviet Union as much as we like to hope that they would be, but they would be really interested in making the Soviet Union look bad in the middle of the Cold War. So Soviet Jewry activists framed freeing Soviet Jews in anti-communist terms. And you may remember the jackson Vanek Amendment passed the US Senate, I think pretty much unanimously, because everyone in the US Senate wants to help Soviet Jews because it helps American democracy. So if you're going to use anti-communism to get support from the US Congress and Senate, you should have had your Soviet Jewry movement in the mid-50s instead of the mid-60s. At the time of McCarthyism, that's when anti-communism was at its height. So as a student of history, my question is, why did the Soviet Jewry movement start and nationalize in 1964, right when Black Power starts? Why didn't it nationalize in 1954? Well, because in the 50s, um, when Jews were moving to the suburbs, for the first time welcomed in the suburbs that wouldn't allow Jews before, the last thing they were going to do is go out into the streets and march and protest for Jewish rights. But by the mid-60s and certainly into the 1970s, thanks to Black Power, it was culturally permissible to be public about your religious and ethnic identity. So the Soviet Jewry movement copied the Black Power activism and the civil rights movement era ideas in order to focus now on the needs of the Jewish community. Zionism as well. In 1948, with the creation of the State of Israel, American Jews were very happy. They were also really relieved just three years after the Shoah, after the Holocaust. They knew there needed to be a homeland for the survivors. And, uh, and they didn't actually get on planes or ships to make Aliyah, to move to Israel. There was really rather limited support. And, and unlike 1948 in the newborn State of Israel, where they were literally dancing in the streets, we didn't see that in America. But something happened after the 1967 Six Day War. After less than a week and Israel's dramatic military victory, American Jews and especially young American Jews were literally dancing in the streets. Their support of Israel and their support of Zionism was so profound, even national Jewish leaders were surprised at how intense their love was. In one hour at a New York City luncheon, they raised $18 million, and that's $1967. In the year after the Six Day War, the UJA, the Israel campaign, doubled the amount of money they did before. 7,500 Jewish college students called their moms, said, mail me my passport, I'm getting on a plane and going to Israel to help the cause. A national public poll showed 97% of American Jews expressing strong sympathy for Israel. Could you imagine today having 97% of American Jews expressing strong sympathy for Israel? Well, my argument in the book is that Jewish nationalism followed black nationalism. If American Jews in the 50s and early 60s were reaching across racial lines, to fight for civil rights for blacks. And then in the mid 60s with rise of black power and black nationalism, the message is, hey, you know, white folk continue to support us, but you can't lead us. And there were purges of whites and purges of Jews from leadership and civil rights organizations. A lot of these young Jews were like, okay, if I can't fight for, for the rights of blacks in the South, I'll, write for the, I'll fight for the right of Jews in the Soviet Union. Um, if Blacks are fighting for Black nationalism, I'll fight for Jewish nationalism. The Six-Day War was timed perfectly, 1967. For two or three years, we had an entire generation of Jewish youth looking for a way to express themselves. And when they did, they reacted with an incredible support of Israel and Zionism. In fact, um, Black Zionism and Jewish Zionism came up as a major theme. This is Rabbi Duff Peretz Elkins, who was then at Har Zion Synagogue in Philadelphia, conservative movement rabbi. And in a sermon, he said, black power is nothing more and nothing less 
than Negro Zionism. Back to our friend Rabbi Hertzberg, Stokely Carmichael, the leader of the Black Power Movement that Kent mentioned earlier, is the most radical kind of Negro Zionist. He talks exactly the language of those Jews who felt most violently angry at the sight of Hitler and most hurt by the good people who stood aside. Even Rabbi Gittleson, the Black Power advocate, is the Negro's Zionist. Africa is his Israel. Shad Polier, to the British people, he said, the Stern Gang in Israel was no less extremist than the Black Nationalists, the so-called Muslim movement in the eyes of the American people. Ben Halpern said Black Power's fundamental meaning is quite clear. It means exactly the same as the equally vague term of auto-emancipation with which Jewish nationalism began in the 1880s. This is astounding. Now, at a time when, when I thought Blacks and Jews were split, they were coming together over nationalism. And even though they did not have physical proximity to one another, they were actually agreeing back and forth. Well, here's my favorite slide, um, because, um, after 1967, Cal Berkeley, my alma mater, um, created a study abroad program at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a whole lot of universities you could do study abroad in Israel. And you've got all these Berkeley radical Jewish hippies who have discovered their Jewishness and their Zionism, and they want to go study in Jerusalem for the year. And they got on planes and they went after 67, and they show up on campus and they got their bell bottoms and they got their beads around their neck and they got marijuana, they got long hair, free love. They got the whole Berkeley hippie scene going. And then they meet their Israeli classmates who are at least three to five years older, clean cut, the intellectual elite of Israel just got out of battle, literally. And they look at these Berkeley kids and they think they're freaks. So if you can imagine that scene, I will argue that these Berkeley Jews were expressing more of their Berkeley-ness, American-ness, 60s-ness, and Black Power-ness than Jewish-ness. Uh, and, uh, and that's essentially the thesis of the book. I have another chapter on the Jewish religious revival. There was a return to tradition. In the African-American community, there was an Afrocentric move where, where, where folks uh, adopted African names, African dress, learned African history, right? Um, and Jews did this too. So um, here's the easy question. What was the most popular book published by uh, the Jewish Publication Society in Philadelphia in this period? The easy, it's the Torah, you know, that, that should be the most popular book of the Jewish Publication Society. The harder question is what was the second most popular book? And just in the interest of time, I'll show you the answer. You can give you a moment if you want to think about it just to yourselves. It's the Jewish catalog. For those of you who don't know the Jewish catalog, I'll tell you. It's how to be Jewish with macrame. It's Jewish do-it-yourself. It's the Jewish version of the whole earth catalog. It's a countercultural book. And most synagogues have like 10 copies. They have a Jewish catalog, a second Jewish catalog, a third Jewish catalog, there's a Jewish kids catalog. You know, like one chapter is how to bake a challah, and another chapter is how to knit your own kippah, and another chapter is how to make your own talit, you know, your own talis. So uh, what's, what's fascinating about this is who would buy such a book? Um, well, to buy a book, you're probably young because it's a countercultural kind of approach. You have to want to do more Jewish things because that's what the book is having you do, which means you weren't raised to learn the things you're going to have to read about in the book. And these young people were raised in the 50s when assimilation and, and blending in was the rule. So what happened? They were raised in the 50s um, alongside white Christian neighbors. They didn't learn this stuff. Then they went through the 60s and black power had every ethnic, racial, gender group learning all about itself and being proud of itself. And they're like, I want to be proud of my Jewishness, and they buy the book. So when it came time for the fourth Jewish catalog, they never made it. And my theory on this is, in all those years that would have passed, the young people that bought the first Jewish catalog, which you see here, you know, would have had kids and raised them in synagogues or sent them to Jewish day school or Jewish summer camps. By the time they would grow up, they don't need no book to tell them how to be Jewish. 
because they know how to be Jewish all by themselves. There was a movement on the political left um, that came out of Black Power. This is the UC Berkeley Radical Jewish Student Union. Um, and uh, I put this up without realizing. This is Professor David Beale. If anyone's read, he's won three National Jewish Book Awards. He has an endowed chair at UC Davis. And um, I gave this talk in White Plains, New York, and the, the, the woman who hosted us, this is her husband. And they apparently have this picture on the refrigerator and we had like no idea. And first of all, I just love the optics. This is like a really Berkeley 60s picture. They even got the, the weapons out, talk about power, you know. Um, they, uh, they were gonna do a sit-in at the Jewish Community Federation, but it wasn't a sit-in because it's a Jewish thing. They made it a pray-in. It was a sit-in, but they prayed. They showed up Friday night, they brought the challah and the wine and the candles, and they said the blessings, and they had Arab Shabbat services in the, in the hallway of Federation because they thought Federation was too secular. And the Jews who controlled Federation were not interested in ethnicity and religion. And they demanded greater funding of Jewish day schools in San Francisco. And they said they would not stop praying until they had an agreement that there would be more support. Um, and uh, for those of us who went to Cal Berkeley, our rival school is Stanford University down the Bay. This pray-in was a Berkeley-Stanford combined effort by the radical students from, from the rival school. So that, that showed how serious they were about Jewish education. So my question for you then, is what letter of the alphabet is going to describe our new historiographic understanding. We've had an X, we've had a Y. So, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one more. The Jewish Defense League. Not only did uh, Jewish leftists embrace black power, those on the Jewish right did as well. Mayor Kahani started the Jewish Defense League in the spirit of Oakland's Black Panther Party. Now, uh, Mayor Kahani was a racist and um, he had armed Jewish vigilante groups in formerly Jewish neighborhoods, which were now populated by communities of color. And he loved the Black Panthers. He loved that they're willing to arm themselves. He loved that they're willing to protect their communities. He saw what Black Panthers were doing in the Black community and said, we need a, ver a Jewish version of the Black Panthers in the Jewish community. The JDL was actually the leader of the Soviet Jewry movement. They would, Kahani and others were the ones that got the rest of the Jewish establishment to pay attention to Soviet Jews because they were unapologetically proud to be Jewish. So here in a weird irony, we have a right-wing Jewish group embracing a left-wing black group because um, both of their strategies met in the middle. Here is my new historiographic school, and we call it a Z. Follow along. Oh, look, blacks and Jews here at the top, marching together, King and Heschel. Oh, isn't this great? Oh, no, look, it goes backwards with black power. Now we're down here on the lower left. But look what happens after black power. Blacks and Jews are paralleling each other, like the top and the bottom of the sea. Even though they're no longer arm in arm, they are still essentially doing the same thing. And uh, everything was great, it would seem, until. I submitted the book. I knew I needed to write an epilogue, just a quick chapter on what's happened since 1980 when the book ended. When I sat down to have a, my regular lunch with Ilana Kaufman, I don't know if you had a chance to learn from Ilana yet. She is the founder and president of the Jews of Color Initiative. She's an African-American Jewish woman. And we're enjoying our lunch. And um, it turns out we had lunch on the 50th anniversary of the Selma March. And to commemorate the 50th anniversary, the NAACP and the URJ, the reform movement, decided to recreate the march by having, it turned out, 200 reform rabbis march with their Torahs from Selma to DC with the NAACP and then have a good voting rights rally. All sounds good, except now that you are all experts in the historiography of this, I thought, oh no, they're going back to the letter Y. They're forgetting the X, they're forgetting the Z. All my rabbi friends are gonna come back from this experience and give sermons that they knew what Heschel felt like. They don't know what Heschel felt like. Heschel was under threat. They were not under threat. Well, Ilana, of course, said, I'm a black Jew. I got another problem with this. Where, where do I fit in this march? And we both knew what this centered on. Yes, it centered on the Facebook photo 
I think all 200 rabbis put their picture up on Facebook. No offense to this rabbi because all of them did it, but it's a white rabbi holding a Torah with a black NAACP member. Ilana asked me, where am I in this picture? If you're a black Jew, what happens? And now we press it further. The phrase black Jewish relations is problematic because it assumes Jews aren't black. Otherwise you don't have relations. So whenever I use black Jewish relations, I'm assuming that the Jews are white and I'm, and I'm erasing the experience of black Jews. So um, we got into it and, and Ilana pushed back on my book. She said, she said, Mark, she said, you've written 200 pages on blacks and Jews and not a single page on a black Jew. And I was like, okay, there weren't that many black Jews. I was talking about the difference between Jewishness and American. I, I just gave it all, right? And she said, what if you went back and reread or rewrote each of your chapters? And instead of asking the question, how much of what you think is Jewish is really being American? Or how much of what you think is Jewish is really being the 60s? Or how much do you think of really being Jewish is really black power, right? That's what I did. She said, why don't you ask the question, how much of being Jewish is really being white? how would you have to redefine the history through a racial lens rather than a national lens? And at that point, it doesn't even matter how many black Jews there are because she challenged my thesis. And I said, that's the epilogue. Thank you, Ilana. So the epilogue of the book uh, deconstructs this 50th anniversary march around that lunch I had with Ilana. And it says, look, as every generation in the historiography brings their own perspective, I have now learned the limits of my own perspective, and I have made an invitation in the epilogue for another scholar to write the book Ilana talked about. Um, I don't think I'm the one to write that, but, uh, but when it does get written, I think we're gonna see a whole new generational understanding. So with that, I thank you, and I turn it back to Alyssa for however you'd like to proceed. Thank you so much. That is, I a tremendous wealth of information um, that I know I will be sitting with for a while to digest. Um, as uh, you know, I, I'd love for everyone to be thinking, if you have any questions, would love for you to type them in the chat. Um, and perhaps in a minute, you can even unmute yourself. And um, we'll take a few, a few questions. Um, but just to kick it off, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as as you've as you've discussed in in this whole uh, in this whole talk and in your book, um, Jews have benefited uh, from the Black Power movement and um, from the Civil Rights movement, in fact, um, and have learned you know um, ways to organize um, and and how to uh, you know continue uh, discussion. So I'm really curious if you have any thoughts about why so many organizations um, today, especially Jewish um, institutions, uh, then decide not to engage. How can we not engage in uh, this continued fight for racial equality? Thank you. Great question. And I'll fold, uh, Kent has a good, good question in the chat, and I'll try to fold, fold that question into this. Um, I have found since the George Floyd murder um, a sea change in white Jewish liberals. To begin with, that's my academic field is white Jewish liberals. Um, there is eagerness to figure out what everyone can do next. Um, I spent more summer teaching Zoom classes than I've ever taught a regular class during the year because of this demand and this interest. And, uh, and I really, I, I, I see not only the best opportunities since the 60s, I actually think what's happening now is bigger than the 60s because we're getting intergenerational, interracial, um, all over the country, small towns, big towns, social media. There's no defined leader here. Um, that, that the dynamics of what's happening at this moment are bigger than the 60s. So we probably have to go back to Reconstruction in 1877, the end of Reconstruction, before we find another moment like this. Why wouldn't they? The number one question that I, that I, I get, it doesn't matter what my topic is, I have four topics and every topic has the same question and, and Kent is, is hinting at it. What about anti-Semitism among some in the African-American community? 
Um, and and this, this is really, I think, the, the leading um, reason why some Jews are concerned. So for this, um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak, a, I'll give an answer I heard from Ilana Kaufman, which, which is what's the point, right? The point is racial justice. So if the goal of American Jews is to fight for racial justice, let's fight for racial justice first and do that. Now, um, there, has, there is anti-Israelism, there's anti-Zionism, and also on occasion, of course, anti-Semitism, which has been coming out from the mid 60s from the new left. And, uh, and this needs to be addressed, right? Each and every place where it is. I think, and now I'm just speaking from my own opinion, the danger is if we as Jews who are committed to racial justice are gonna sort of take our ball and go home because there are some in the black community who have expressed anti-Semitic things, then we are not achieving the goal that we are trying to have. Since I get the question so much, I reached out to friends of mine who are actually political activists and, or, and I said, so how are you dealing with, with the anti-Semitism as you see it and as you hear it? And what they're saying is, um, well, first of all, there's an inequity um, in, in terms of sort of making some all black leaders denounce other black leaders for saying things that are anti-Semitic because this is actually something that doesn't happen across racial lines. But what they said is, um, it, we do, they do much better in proximity. Like if, if they are marching for racial justice and they're sitting next to somebody for racial justice and then Israel comes up and that person says something anti-Israel, they said, I would much rather share with them my love of Israel and, and Zionism when I'm sitting next to them rather than when I'm, you know, uh, back in my suburban home um, complaining. If folks are interested, when Deshaun Jackson, um, who was a football player, came out with an anti-Semitic statement and then several other African-American celebrities did, the NFL Network reached out to me um, and I went on the NFL Network and um, it, it came up into sort of four sort of shorter eight to 10 minute interviews um, with um, a, a Jewish uh, lineman from the Kansas City Chiefs and a Pittsburgh Steelers lineman who actually put out a wonderful video sort of uh, condemning anti-Semitism. So if you just uh, you know, type in my name with NFL Network, you'll see those, I talk about it there. And then Don Lemon from CNN, he has a podcast called Silence Is Not An Option. And I literally got a call from him two days later. And uh, I did that podcast with Gina Green, an African-American Jewish woman, and also Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It turns out as a Laker fan, he was on it as well. Sadly, we recorded separately, so I didn't get a chance to, to chat with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But if you go to Don Lemon, Silence is Not an Option in My Name, you'll, you'll see that too. And we, we also got into this question. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we have a question from uh, Lindsay Mintz, um, who also runs a, a JCRC. Um, how can we bring this learning into our Black Jewish relations? Thank you. Great question. And Lindsay, I just want to say I love your name. It is my middle name as well. I'm Mark Lindsay Dollinger. So anytime I see a Lindsay, I get very excited. Not too many Lindsays around. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you, a, I'll give you a, the hard answer and then a harder answer. Um, when I told that story, when I got laughed at at age 18 for wanting to have a black Jewish relationship, that actually goes really deep. White Jews are really interested in black Jewish relations. Blacks for the most part aren't. As an academic, I will tell you the number of scholars in African-American history who do a black Jewish relations compared to the number of scholars in American Jewish history. When my book went out for anonymous review, I, they sent it out, I think, to three professors. Um, and one of the three wrote back and said, you need to have an African-American studies scholar read this thing, which is, of course, I should have thought of that. I gave them the seven or eight professors who have ever published anything in the field, and none of them would, would even read it, right? And I don't blame them, right? Because what, what I've learned, you know, in my, in my decades of studying this is, being black in America, you got a lot more to worry about than your relationship with, with white Jews, you know, and they got enough on their plate. So, so the flip side of that is, well, and, I, and I'm front and center because I'm, I'm a scholar of it. Why are we so, why are we as white Jews then so interested in this? Um, what, what does that say about our Jewishness or our whiteness? Um, so to directly answer Lindsay's question, how can we uh, bring this learning into our black Jewish relationship? I think taking action is key. Um, and action would be rooted in, uh, for me, whatever your professional field is, um, experience or interest or passion. All right, so I'll, I'll start with me. I, I'm an educator. Um, so 
uh, in black Jewish relations, what I want to do is educate as many Jews and mostly white Jews, you know, are showing up um, to this. Um, and that's sort of my part. And I'm working in with the Jews of color community, you know, uh, you know, as well, so that they, they, they know what's going on to support them in what they're doing. I bet a lot of you are in, went to law school. There is so much systemic racism in the law and in, in different communities and different places. So if you went to law school or you're working in the law, go to your legal associations and find out what they're doing. I bet a lot of you are in the healthcare professions too, right? And, and healthcare is also something that's, that's worked out there. So what I get a lot is um, from communities of color, we're less interested in your resolutions and your pronouncements and your prayers, and we're more interested in, in knowing that you have our back. So I would say it's less about bringing learning to black Jewish relations and more about showing up. Um, and, and showing up really depends on where, where you wanna pick to make your influence um, and then start getting on the phone or sending some emails around and figure out how you can show up. Showing up is a, a big part of it. I mean, it's, it's half the battle, it's just showing up. Um, so uh, I, I really want to thank you so much, Dr. Dolinger, for, for your time and your insight. Um, and I, I'm really curious about who's going to pick up on your epilogue and who's going to write the story about Black Jews and Jews of color. Um, because I, I, we need to continue to, to lift up the, the multiracial diversity of the, the Jewish community across the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, the call is out there. Let's find someone to write this. <laughs> um, but uh, in, as, we, as we wrap up tonight's uh, talk, I wanna thank you all so, so much for joining us um, on this journey. And uh, thank you, Dr. Dollinger, for your insight and, um, and information to help us move forward. Um, the JCRC of St. Louis is committed to continuing uh, learning and dialogue and eventually taking action um, to make sure that we're working towards racial equity in St. Louis and the surrounding region. And we have a tremendous number of programs that are coming up over the next few months. And uh, we really look forward to announcing those details um, in the next week or two. So look out for those. But if you uh, have enjoyed tonight's program and you'd like to continue seeing programs like this from the JCRC, we really do depend on your support. Um, and so we are really excited to be hosting a promotion through the end of the month. Um, if you give a donation of $180 or more to the JCRC before August 31st, um, we are going to be sending you a signed and personalized copy of Dr. Dolinger's most recent book, Black Power Jewish Politics, um, as you've heard mentioned many times tonight. And you can read that epilogue and then make the call yourself. Um, but uh, we, we really would appreciate your support. Uh, you can make your donations at our website. That's www.jcrcstl.org. Um, and I will be sending out a follow-up email. Uh, so again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, Phyllis and Dr. Dolinger, and for everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>